This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Chris Bellamy. Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens. Chapter 22. The Burglary. Hello, cried a loud hoarse voice as soon as they set foot in the passage. Don't make such a row, said Sykes, bolting the door. Show a glim, Toby. Aha, my pal, cried the same voice. A glim, Barney, a glim. Show the gentleman in, Barney. Wake up first, if convenient. The speaker appeared to throw a boot jack or some such article at the person he addressed to rouse him from his slumbers, for the noise of a wooden body falling violently was heard and then an indistinct muttering, as of a man between sleep and awake. "'Do you hear?' cried the same voice. "'There's Bill Sykes in the passage, with nobody to do the civil to him. And you sleeping there as if you took laudanum with your meals, and nothing stronger. Are you any fresher now, or do you want the iron candlestick to wake you thoroughly?' A pair of slipshod feet shuffled hastily across the bare floor of the room, as this interrogatory was put and there issued from a door on the right hand first a feeble candle, and next the form of the same individual who had been heretofore described as laboring under the infirmity of speaking through his nose, and officiating as a waiter at the public house on Saffron Hill. "'Mr. Sykes!' exclaimed Barney, with real or counterfeit joy. "'Cabid, sir! Cabid! "'Here, you get on first, said Sykes, putting Oliver in front of him. "'Quicker, or I shall tread upon your heels.' Muttering a curse upon his tardiness, Sykes pushed Oliver before him, and they entered a low, dark room with a smoky fire, two or three broken chairs, a table, and a very old couch, on which, with his legs much higher than his head, a man was reposing at full length, smoking a long clay pipe. He was dressed in a smartly cut, snuff-colored coat with large brass buttons, an orange neckerchief, a coarse, staring, shawl-patterned waistcoat, and drab breeches. Mr. Crackett, for he it was, had no very great quantity of hair, either upon his head or face, but what he had was of a reddish dye, and tortured into long corkscrew curls, through which he occasionally thrust some very dirty fingers, ornamented with large common rings. He was a trifle above the middle size, and apparently rather weak in the legs, but this circumstance by no means detracted from his own admiration of his top boots, which he contemplated in their elevated situation with lively satisfaction. "'Bill, my boy,' said this figure, turning his head towards the door, "'I'm glad to see you. I was almost afraid you'd given it up, in which case I should have made a personal winter. Hello!' Uttering this exclamation in a tone of great surprise, as his eyes rested on Oliver, Mr. Toby Crackett brought himself into a sitting posture and demanded who that was. "'The boy, only the boy,' replied Sykes, drawing a chair towards the fire. "'What of Mr. Fagin's lads?' exclaimed Barney with a grin. "'Fagin's, eh?' exclaimed Toby, looking at Oliver. "'What an inwallable boy that'll make, for the old lady's pockets and chapels. His mug is a fortin' to him.' "'There, there's enough of that,' interposed Sykes impatiently, and stooping over his recumbent friend, he whispered a few words in his ear, at which Mr. Crackett laughed immensely and honored Oliver with a long stare of astonishment. Now, said Sykes, as he resumed his seat, if you'll give us something to eat and drink while we're waiting, you'll put some heart in us, or in me at all events. Sit down by the fire, Yunker, and rest yourself, for you'll have to go out with us again tonight, though not very far off. Oliver looked at Sykes in mute and timid wonder, and drawing a stool to the fire, sat with his aching head upon his hands, scarcely knowing where he was or what was passing around him. Here, said Toby, as the young Jew placed some fragments of food and a bottle upon the table. Success to the crack, he rose to honor the toast, and carefully depositing his empty pipe in a corner, advanced to the table, filled a glass with spirits, and drank off its contents. Mr. Sykes did the same. A drain for the boy, said Toby, half filling a wine glass. Down with it, innocence. Indeed, said Oliver, looking piteously up into the man's face. Indeed, I... Down with it, echoed Toby. Do you think I don't know what's good for you? Tell him to drink it, Bill. He had better, said Sykes, clapping his hand upon his pocket. Burn my body if he isn't in more trouble than a whole family of dodgers. Drink it, you perverse imp. Drink it. Frightened by the menacing gestures of the two men, 
Oliver hastily swallowed the contents of the glass and immediately fell into a violent fit of coughing, which delighted Toby Crackett and Barney, and even drew a smile from the surly Mr. Sykes. This done, and Sykes having satisfied his appetite, Oliver could eat nothing but a small crust of bread which they made him swallow, the two men laid themselves down on chairs for a short nap. Oliver retained his stool by the fire. Barney, wrapped in a blanket, stretched himself on the floor, close outside the fender. They slept, or appeared to sleep, for some time, nobody stirring but Barney, who rose once or twice to throw coals on the fire. Oliver fell into a heavy doze, imagining himself straying along the gloomy lanes, or wandering about the dark churchyard, or retracing some one or other of the scenes of the past day, when he was roused by Toby Crackett jumping up and declaring that it was half-past one. In an instant, the other two were on their legs, and all were actively engaged in busy preparation. Sykes and his companion enveloped their necks and chins in large, dark shawls, and drew on their greatcoats. Barney, opening a cupboard, brought forth several articles, which he hastily crammed into the pockets. Barkers for me, Barney, said Toby Crackett. Here they are, replied Barney, producing a pair of pistols. You loaded them yourself. All right, replied Toby, stowing them away. The persuaders? I've got a replied Sykes. Crepe, keys, center bits, darkies, nothing forgotten, inquired Toby, fastening a small crowbar to a loop inside the skirt of his coat. All right, rejoined his companion. Bring them bits of timber, Barney. That's the time of day. With these words, he took a thick stick from Barney's hands, who, having delivered another to Toby, busied himself in fastening on Oliver's cape. Now then, said Sykes, holding out his hand. Oliver, who was completely stupefied by the unwanted exercise and the air and the drink which had been forced upon him, put his hand mechanically into that which Sykes extended for the purpose. Take his other hand, Toby, said Sykes. Look out, Barney. The man went to the door and returned to announce that all was quiet. The two robbers issued forth with Oliver between them. Barney, having made all fast, rolled himself up as before and was soon asleep again. It was now intensely dark. The fog was much heavier than it had been in the early part of the night, and the atmosphere was so damp that although no rain fell, Oliver's hair and eyebrows, within a few minutes after leaving the house, had become stiff with the half-frozen moisture that was floating about. They crossed the bridge and kept on towards the lights, which he had seen before. They were at no great distance off, and as they walked pretty briskly, they soon arrived at Chertsey. Slap through the town, whispered Sykes. There will be nobody in the way tonight to see us. Toby acquiesced, and they hurried through the main street of the little town, which at that late hour was wholly deserted. A dim light shone at intervals from some bedroom, and the hoarse barking of dogs occasionally broke the silence of the night but there was nobody abroad. They had cleared the town as the church bell struck two. Quickening their pace, they turned up a road upon the left hand. After walking about a quarter of a mile, they stopped before a detached house, surrounded by a wall, to the top of which Toby Crackett, scarcely pausing to take breath, climbed in a twinkling. The boy next, said Toby. Hoist him up. I'll catch hold of him. Before Oliver had time to look around, Sykes had caught him under the arms, and in three or four seconds he and Toby were lying on the grass on the other side. Sykes followed directly, and they stole cautiously towards the house. And now, for the first time, Oliver, well nigh mad with grief and terror, saw that housebreaking and robbery, if not murder, were the objects of the expedition. He clasped his hands together and involuntarily uttered a subdued exclamation of horror. A mist came before his eyes. The cold sweat stood upon his ashy face, his limbs failed him, and he sank upon his knees. Get up, murmured Sykes, trembling with rage and drawing the pistol from his pocket. Get up or I'll strew your brains upon the grass. Oh, for God's sake, let me go, cried Oliver. Let me run away and die in the fields. I will never come near London, never, never. Oh, pray have mercy on me, and do not make me steal. For the love of all the bright angels that rest in heaven, have mercy upon me. The man to whom this appeal was made swore a dreadful oath and had cocked the pistol when Toby, striking it from his grasp, placed his hands upon the boy's mouth and dragged him to the house. Hush, cried the man. It won't answer here. 
Say another word, and I'll do your business myself with a crack on the head. That makes no noise and is quite as certain and more genteel. Here, Bill, wrench the shutter open. He's game enough now, I'll engage. I've seen older hands of his age took the same way for a minute or two on a cold night. Sykes, invoking terrific imprecations upon Fagin's head for sending Oliver on such an errand, plied the crowbar vigorously, but with little noise. After some delay, and some assistance from Toby, the shutter to which he had referred swung open on its hinges. It was a little lattice window, about five feet and a half above the ground at the back of the house, which belonged to a scullery, or small brewing place, at the end of the passage. The aperture was so small that the inmates had probably not thought it worth while to defend it more securely, but it was large enough to admit a boy of Oliver's size nevertheless. A very brief exercise of Mr. Sykes' art sufficed to overcome the fastening of the lattice, and it soon stood wide open also. "'Now listen, you young limb,' whispered Sykes, drawing a dark lantern from his pocket and throwing the glare full on Oliver's face. "'I'm a-going to put you through there. Take this light, go softly up the steps straight afore you, and along the little hall to the street door, unfasten it, and let us in.' "'There's a bolt at the top you won't be able to reach,' interposed Toby. "'Stand upon one of the hall chairs. "'There are three there, Bill, with a jolly large blue unicorn and gold pitchfork on them, "'which is the old lady's arms.' "'Keep quiet, can't you?' replied Sykes with a threatening look. "'The room door is open, is it?' "'Wide,' replied Toby, after peeping in to satisfy himself. "'The game of that is that they always leave it open with a catch, "'so that the dog, who's got a bed in here, may walk up and down the passage when he feels wakeful. Ha! Huh, ha! Huh, Barney ticed him away tonight. So neat. Although Mr. Crackett spoke in a scarcely audible whisper and laughed without noise, Sykes imperiously commanded him to be silent and to get to work. Toby complied by first producing his lantern and placing it on the ground, then by planting himself firmly with his head against the wall beneath the window and his hands upon his knees so as to make a step of his back, this was no sooner done than Sykes, mounting upon him, put Oliver gently through the window with his feet first, and without leaving hold of his collar, planted him safely on the floor inside. Take this lantern, said Sykes, looking into the room. You see the stairs afore you? Oliver, more dead than alive, gasped out, Yes. Sykes, pointing to the street door with the pistol barrel, briefly advised him to take notice that he was within shot all the way and that if he faltered, he would fall dead that instant. "'It's done in a minute,' said Sykes, in the same low whisper. "'Directly I leave go of you, do your work. "'Hark!' "'What's that?' whispered the other man. "'They listened intently. "'Nothing,' said Sykes, releasing his hold of Oliver. "'Now!' "'In the short time he had to collect his senses, "'the boy had firmly resolved that whether he died in the attempt or not, "'he would make one effort to dart upstairs from the hall and alarm the family.' Filled with this idea, he advanced at once, but stealthily. "'Come back!' suddenly cried Sykes aloud. "'Back! Back!' Scared by the sudden breaking of the dead stillness of the place, and by a loud cry which followed it, Oliver let his lantern fall, and knew not whether to advance or fly. The cry was repeated. A light appeared. A vision of two terrified half-dressed men at the top of the stairs swam before his eyes. A flash! A loud noise! A smoke! A crash somewhere, but where he knew not, and he staggered back. Sykes had disappeared for an instant, but he was up again, and had him by the collar before the smoke had cleared away. He fired his own pistol after the men, who were already retreating, and dragged the boy up. "'Clasp your arm tighter,' said Sykes, as he drew him through the window. "'Give me a shawl here. They've hit him. Quick! How the boy bleeds!' Then came the loud ringing of a bell, mingled with the noise of firearms and the shouts of men, and the sensation of being carried over uneven ground at a rapid pace. And then the noises grew confused in the distance, and a cold, deadly feeling crept over the boy's heart, and he saw or heard no more. End of chapter 22